Hey everybody, Russell Linville here. Hey, checking back in with you. This is common elbow surgeries in the orthopedic and sports world. And so this is a, kind of a very, very basic uh, rundown of uh, elbow surgeries and the post-operative implications for physical therapy. Um, yeah, this is obviously for MSK1. As you move along in your uh, orthopedic and musculoskeletal track in uh, PT school, you will learn more in depth about some of this, but hopefully this is a nice uh, introduction to some of the most common elbow surgeries uh, that you may see in the outpatient setting. So objectives, there's introduction to common types of orthopedic uh, elbow surgeries and understand basic post-operative guidelines, restrictions, and precautions. And so what you see in the pictures here is two different types of uh, body positions for the elbow. One is the lateral decubitus position, which is the bottom left, uh, labeled A and B, and then you have um, kind of your standard inner elbow, medial elbow uh, uh, prep, which uh, the patient just lays literally on the table, right? And uh, their arms like this. It's really actually kind of by their side. And uh, they're well padded, of course. And, uh, their arms stabilized at the distal end. You can see that uh, here. And this gives access to the inner elbow for things like Tommy John surgery or ulnar nerve transposition, things like that which we'll go over uh, in this lecture, of course. So here are the um, surgeries we'll be going over. This is, this is kind of your most common orthopedic elbow surgeries uh, listed in each category here. So of course, uh, you have your debridements, you have your osteo and or chondral surgeries, you have your quote unquote repairs, your reconstructions, your arthroplasties, and then your decompression. So the, the ones in bold are the ones we'll go over. So we'll go over elbow ORIF, we'll talk about um, chondral, uh, you know, like an OCD lesion management, so we'll talk about the cartilage uh, in that sense, and uh, we'll talk about UCL repair and also a UCL reconstruction. Uh, don't confuse the two, they are separate uh, surgeries, but with the goal of um, accomplishing the same task. Uh, we have tendon repairs, distal biceps, distal triceps. And of course, uh, total elbow arthroplasty, and then finally an ulnar nerve transposition. And it won't be in this exact order as I just spouted it off to you, but uh, we'll have some structure to the lecture here. So if we get into it, first up is elbow open reduction internal fixation. So what is ORIF? What does that mean? We talk about briefly with the shoulder. If we look at the bottom two bullets here, open reduction means an incision is made to open the open the skin, open the anatomy, to access the fracture. The fracture is then reduced to an anatomical position. So it's an open incision, reduced fracture, open reduction. Internal fixation means a fixation device is used to stabilize the fracture, and that involves things like plates, screws, wires, pins, you know, those sorts of things. Stabilize below and above the fracture line. And so uh, the surgical goals here is very simple, is to fixate the fracture, to fix the fracture and put it in the most uh, anatomical position possible to allow for uh, tissue healing. So this um, table looks probably familiar from the shoulder lectures. So we'll talk about surgical candidates, precautions, restrictions, outcomes, and potential complications. So for in this case, the elbow ORIF, uh, Obviously, the candidates here are people who sustain a fracture. Uh, maybe sometimes people who have an elbow dislocation may also have a uh, fracture dislocation. They might have to uh, have this procedure done. Precautions or restrictions postoperatively. You're going to follow bony healing timelines, typically a period of mobilization, uh, usually about six weeks. And then when appropriate, PT is initiated to begin gentle, passive, and active assisted range of motion. And bone healing timelines, roughly six to eight weeks. Uh, sometimes sooner with things like a bone stimulator, uh, like in pro sports, but typically six to eight weeks is solid. If you have someone with osteoporosis or if someone who's elderly, maybe eight to ten weeks. But this is usually determined by uh, repeat radiographs postoperatively to determine the stage of healing and how we can progress them. So the outcomes are very good. Uh, stabilization. Uh, with immobilization, however, can create stiffness, especially in the elbow. And that's one of the big complications here with an elbow or IF is 
is a long-term stiffness uh, of the elbow. So uh, very tough to, to fight that. <clears throat> Potential complications include non-union, infection, pain from the fixation hardware long-term, and then, of course, uh, stiffness. This is a review from the elbow differential lecture, but different types of fractures uh, are listed here. And uh, you should review these, and we'll go through um, on some of the pictures here. We have a distal humerus fracture. It's going to be called a supracondylar fracture uh, or a distal humeral fracture. Either one's a fine terminology. Uh, you can see the before and after shots here. Same thing, medial epicondyle fracture, usually involved with throwers, gymnasts, things like that. Uh, anything that creates valgus stress to the elbow in a skeletally immature individual is usually what these are in. Uh, uh, the growth plate is weaker than the UCL, and so instead of the UCL tearing, the, the growth plate fractures and uh, can be, become displaced, which means you need a screw to, to uh, replace it, essentially. You have your radial head fractures, and so just to remind you guys, you have your type 1, which is kind of that intraarticular fracture there. You have a type 2, which is a displaced fracture. You have a type 3, which is a comminuted fracture, and uh, that's that's not good. And at the bottom, you can see different ways to fix it with uh, pins and screws and plates like an ORIF, or you have a radial head uh, arthroplasty replacement. Electronon fractures. So as we're going through this, you should be able to see start seeing the fracture line. So you know, fracture line would be here on the ulna. You guys can see that clearly, I'm sure. And so how that's fixed, and you can see the three screws above the fracture line and three screws below the fracture line to stabilize that. And those are probably going in, you know, a three-dimensional sort of uh, capacity. Instead of this 2D image, it looks like it's just going straight through. They're probably angled slightly, of course, too help with the fracture. This is a coronoid fracture and so this can happen during an elbow dislocation. Uh, if you think about a posterior driven force of the ulna uh, backwards, the tip of this can, can hit the distal humerus and fracture. Uh, so uh, that's how they fix that. And this is a Montesia fracture. So this is that fracture that is your proximal uh, third of your ulna fractures as well as your uh, radial head dislocate. So it's a fracture dislocation. And usually when we say that term fracture dislocation just means that um, typically we're talking about the one bone. Like you fracture, you dislocate your ulna posteriorly and also fracture it. And this one is just uh, it's a fracture of one bone and dislocation of the other. I do encourage you to pause it here and uh, write down these URLs and uh, observe, you know, virtually some surgeries. And so these are all YouTube links that you can click on um, or, excuse me, type in and see. So I've put on here Electronon ORIF, so you get an idea, and Pediatric Supracondylar Humerus Fracture Pinning. Now, the one thing with surgeries, uh, you know, I'm not a big trigger warning guy. You guys are professionals. Uh, but obviously with surgery, you're going to see, you know, blood, tissues that are cut into, uh, things of that nature. Uh, I feel personally that you should watch these. Uh, if you know that you have a really, very hard time doing so, then it's not mandatory, of course, but I think an appreciation for the surgeries will give you a better understanding of how to treat the patient. And so I encourage you to give it a shot and see. All right, next up, we're going to talk about OCD lesion, surgical management, post-operative considerations for the PT. So this was taken from a um, Logley uh, et al. study, also with Dr. Chris Camp um, as, as one of the authors as well. He's one of the, uh, the surgeons for the Minnesota Twins up here. Had a chance to talk to him about some of this stuff. Um, and so in doing so, I decided to put this OCD lesion of the capitellum um, flow chart in there and how do we decide who needs surgery who doesn't so if we follow down the left you have a stable um, OCD lesion that the symptoms are greater than three to six months have they tried non-operative treatment uh, 
you rest uh, six weeks, begin physical therapy. Uh, if they're not getting better, you do imaging three to six months. If they've shown clinical improvement and healing, then they return to sport. And you know, if you follow down the right side, if they're unstable, then they're just going straight to operative, meaning they have a loose body, uh, uh, it's a large lesion, and so we'll get we'll get into some of this as we go. But this study I will try to include in your reading list. And so you can certainly read that and uh, go from there. Surgical candidates to see the previous slide for the treatment algorithm. Precautions and restrictions. So postoperatively, range of motion is encouraged early and often. And uh, there's three types of surgery that can be done. If we go back to the previous slide for a second, you can have drilling. And so I'll describe what that is in another slide. You can have debridement and microfracture. And you can have fragment fixation. So you can do that through bone grafting, or you can do that do that through like an oat procedure, osteochondral uh, autograft transplantation. So back to restrictions and precautions. Uh, range of motion is encouraged early and often. Restricted weight bearing for a period of time, especially in uh, something like an oats procedure. No heavy lifting for at least twelve weeks. Outcomes are generally good. Please read the Logley et al. Uh, study for comprehensive summary uh, of the surgical uh, treatment outcomes. Potential complications are infection, uh, graft failure, stiffness, graft donor site complications, so that's usually in the knee. You can have pain or effusion from the knee. So let's talk about debridement and microfracture of an OCD lesion, um, as well as drilling. And so if we look here on the uh, the bullet points. Drilling is performed by drilling multiple small holes in the subchondral bone to stimulate a biologic response and healing for the subchondral bone and the cartilage. The subchondral bone uh, is where the failure is and so if you have drilling into that bone then hopefully that will uh, elicit a uh, healing response and the overlying cartilage is still intact so we hope that that would just harden the bone underneath of it. Debridement is often considered when the cartilage is compromised. So go in and remove unstable cartilage and uh, necrotic bone via curette or shaver. And likewise, we'll usually do a microfracture at the same time, <clears throat> which involves using the awl, uh, using an awl to impact below the level of the subchondral bone to allow bleeding and bone marrow to fill in the lesion bed. So. Uh, some of this is hard to picture, me just saying it, this is where the surgical videos will come in handy. You'll see the links to those soon. And of course we have loose body removal, so any free floating pieces of cartilage uh, will be removed. And what is OATS? You heard that term before, OATS, osteochondral autogalous transfer system. So let's break that down, osteochondral, so bone and cartilage, autogalous, so auto meaning from you, transfer. So we're transferring bone and cartilage from yourself to another part of yourself. And that's what oats means or oat. Um, and you can do this in multiple areas of the body. Probably the most common I think is the knee, maybe followed by the elbow, um, but uh, kind of the hinge joints there. Oats, there seem to be superior results in the knee when compared to microfracture. And the um, problem is that early on, it's, it's a much more invasive uh, procedure, obviously. Uh, about 90% survival rate at eight years. Donor site is typically from a non-weight-bearing portion of the knee, like the lateral femoral condyle, uh, and then transferred to the elbow. 90% healing rates, excellent function, high return to sports, and several studies have shown this uh, a little over a decade ago. Surgical videos, again, I'd like you to uh, try to view these. One is a debridement and microfracture, and the other is a OATS procedure, uh, which uh, will give you much more clarity on the difference between these types of surgeries. Next up, we have UCL repair versus reconstruction. And so we'll talk about these two uh, surgeries, uh, a lot of the same postoperative restrictions and precautions. Um, however, the 
reason why you would get a repair versus reconstruction are different. So let's get into it uh, a little bit here. What is the difference? A UCL repair, and usually what that, um, you know, most popularly now is with uh, something called an internal brace. And that's surgical tape dipped in collagen. And so the native UCL is repaired. And then uh, to brace the native ligament, uh, a piece of collagen tape is, is used to secure uh, the repair and secure the ligament back down to uh, the, the area where it evolves from. So if that doesn't make sense, let me, let me try to clarify it because I think I'm doing a poor job of uh, uh, explaining this. If you have a tear to your UCL, if you have a distal only or proximal only tear, then that uh, the body of the UCL is intact meaning it's not a mid-substance tear. So you can choose to repair that by tacking down that loose end. And so what they've done, that would be called a direct repair. And over the years, um, they've tried doing a direct repair to athletes in the past, and the outcomes have not been very good. About four or five, maybe six years ago, um, maybe even a little longer, uh, Dr. Dugas, Jeff Dugas, uh, he's out of Alabama. He uh, got the idea from ankle surgeries to start using um, a te technique they use in the lateral ankle, which is to use a, a piece of surgical tape, which has high tensile strength, to augment and reinforce a UCL re direct repair. And so now these are called UCL repairs with internal bracing. And um, this allows for faster recovery than a typical Tommy John. And the one um, downside, though, is there's no long-term data. But if there is a re-injury, say a baseball pitcher, <clears throat> this can be converted to a UCL, UCL reconstruction. Uh, and what I've seen is it's been mainly performed on high school athletes uh, in my practice. And so UCL reconstructions is what you guys probably heard of on the news and with athletes and things. It's a graft it, uh, is taken to reconstruct the native uh, ligament. And so this is usually done in mid-substance tears where you can't just tack down one end. It's usually done in higher level athletes like your collegiate or your professional baseball players. And the reason being so is they have a little more leeway to rehab uh, and they also have uh, better long-term data on uh, the rehabilitation protocol and outcomes. So UCL repair with the internal brace return to throwing is around 16 weeks. <clears throat> that's that's at least in my practice. Uh, can be sooner. Uh, I think the protocol states that start around 12 weeks. I just think it's a little too fast. Uh, it got to be cleared by the surgeon and by your objective or functional test. So this is from the Dugas article explaining the surgery back in 2019. The UCL reconstruction is a little different. A lot more tissue damage, which accounts for the slower rehabilitation timeline of returning to throwing at five months, or around 22 weeks. Full return to pitching in the uh, uh, Major League Baseball is around 13 months. So graft options here, you can use an ipsilateral palmaris longus, and the way you find that is you oppose your thumb and your pinky, and then you resist wrist flexion, and what should pop out is your palmaris longus. Some people do not have it. It's starting to become a vestigial muscle, meaning some people are born without them. And so as you can see in this person, in the picture on the top left, their left hand has a palmaris longus, their right hand does not. <clears throat> they make an incision at the wrist crease, and they harvest that, that muscle and that tendon to make the graft. What you see in the picture on the bottom right is a device used to help drill uh, tunnels into your bone to lace that 
graphed through to create the new UCL. This big spaghetti noodle looking thing here, that is your ulnar nerve. And so as you can see, this uh, retractor is here to protect the ulnar nerve from any sort of uh, damage. So who gets these type of surgeries? Well, usually people obviously that are UCL insufficient. That could be baseball or overhead athletes that require throwing. A lot of um, torque goes through the elbow as we have gone over in previous lectures. Contact sports athletes, uh, especially ones that may require weight bearing, but non-athletes may be able to cope. Like let's say you just fell on you know, an out, you know, outstretched arm, had a foosh injury, and your, your elbow um, twisted the wrong way and you tore your UCL. Uh, well, if you're not an athlete that requires that ligament, you may be able to cope and avoid surgery. Uh, restrictions and precautions after surgery for both of these surgeries, right? The, the reason we do the surgery is the same, just some implications for which procedure get done are different. So the restrictions are we want to avoid valgus stress, you have gradual return to full extension. At least that's how the protocols are written now. There's some debate on, on that in the literature, but um, gradual return to full extension. So gradual opening of a postoperative brace to improve range of motion. And this um, return to full range of motion is faster for the UCL repair, slower for the reconstruction. Uh, just because of the amount of tissue damage that's occurred with the reconstruction. Uh, outcomes. Reconstruction has the long-term outcomes. UCL repair has very good early outcomes. And anecdotally, in my practice, uh, patients are doing very well. Uh, they're usually discharging with, with really good results. I got a pitcher, college pitcher right now that's uh, just hit 90 miles an hour. He's about 11 months, 12 months out from this procedure. He's doing very well. So potential complications are infection, pain, stiffness. Uh, ulnar nerve injury is one of the big ones here, as well as heterotopic ossification, so abnormal bone growth uh, in the elbow. Surgical videos, one from Dr. Jeff Dugas himself, with UCL repair with an internal brace augmentation, and one from Dr. David Olchek, who is a um, high-level elbow surgeon, I believe out of the um, Hospital for Special Surgery in New York. And so he's doing UCL reconstruction with a palmaris longus autograft. While we're at the medial elbow, we might as well talk about ulnar nerve transposition. And so you know where the ulnar nerve is for ulnar nerve issues, ulnar neuritis, cubital tunnel syndrome, things of that nature. And so as we get into here, surgical candidates are it's used to treat ulnar neuritis at the level of the cubital tunnel, usually in overhead throwing athletes, but also could be in manual laborists or desk workers. I've even seen it in boxers, like recreational boxers. Um, not like Amazon warehouse boxing, you know, people boxing things, but like actual like fighting boxers. And precautions and restrictions. Well, usually there's an initial period of immobilization after surgery. It's followed by a slow reintroduction of range of motion. After six weeks, if no complications, you can progress slowly back into your desired goals. <clears throat> At 12 weeks, you can return to throwing. If it's a combination of a UCL repair or reconstruction, then we follow those protocols because they actually go slower than a typical ulnar nerve transposition protocol. Uh, so outcomes here from a Hadley et al. study, ulnar nerve transposition in throwing athletes allows the uh, athletes to return to throwing with low reoperation rates. However, in this study, more than half of the athletes sustained a subsequent ipsilateral shoulder or elbow injury. So. Maybe the underlying cause wasn't the nerve. Maybe it's mechanics or something like that. So potential complications could have iatrogenic injury to the nerve, meaning uh, the nerve is injured in the process of transposing it. And you could have a failed flash, uh, fascial sling leading to recurrent instability or recurrent ulnar nerve symptoms. And some, some of those um, terms like fascial sling you will learn here when you watch the surgery video. The actual operation, you know, we did, this should have been one slide previous, so they're a little out of order um, as I'm presenting now, but 
You have medial elbow pain from your ulnar nerve. An incision is made. <laughs> they take the ulnar nerve and they move it from behind your medial elbow condyle to in front of it. And so it sits you know, in front of your medial elbow condyle here rather than in the cubital tunnel there. And so that's, that's the surgery. Transfer, transpose the ulnar nerve out of the tunnel. And here's Dr. Chris Ahmad doing an ulnar nerve transposition. He's, uh, again, like Dr. Dugas and Dr. Alchek, Dr. Ahmad is one of the best elbow surgeons in the country. And he is the team doc for the New York Yankees. Now we'll get into our tendon repairs. This is distal, uh, distal biceps tendon repair uh, considerations here. So surgical candidates, obviously those who sustain a distal biceps tendon rupture. This is usually young to middle age. Elderly people may choose to forego this surgery because you can still live without a uh, biceps tendon. However, you will lose strength. So precautions and restrictions postoperatively. You're going to have a gradual opening of the brace over time to allow for more extension. You want to avoid resisted supination or resisted elbow flexion for quite some time. You start active range of motion at six weeks light isotonic strengthening at 10 weeks. And then if you're able to go through 12 weeks and no complications, then at 12 weeks you can start um, strength training principles, starting really light, but starting to periodize a little bit if uh, the patient wants that. Outcomes are really good actually. Low re-rupture rate, about one to 2%. Distal biceps repairs associated with about a 7.5% major complication rate and about a 4.5% a percent reoperation rate. The use of a two incision technique for repair increases the risk of radial ulnar synostosis. This, of course, from a Ford et al. study, as you can see the reference there. And potential complications are tendon repair failure, redundancy, or stretch, <clears throat> or you might lose a leg, uh, the, the length tension relationship. Could have loss of elbow range of motion due to stiffness. Could have um, proximal radial ulnar synostosis heterotropic ossification or loss of range of motion of the reoperation. Infection, posterior interosseous nerve palsy. Remember um, the PIN nerve, right? The PIN, yeah, posterior interosseous nerve. Review that from differential compressive neuropathy lecture. And then <clears throat> sometimes you can get complex regional pain syndrome from something like this. This is one technique they use. I'll just give you kind of a visual. They... Uh, just tack down the the uh, distal biceps tendon. Here's a surgical video to view. And on the back side of the elbow, we have a distal triceps tendon repair. Similar to the biceps, this is for individuals who sustain a tendon rupture, of course, to the triceps at this time. Usually seen in weightlifters, bodybuilders, caused by a hyperflexed elbow during a fall or brace. So your elbow is flexing at a force higher than what you can extend against. And so that large elbow flexion under eccentric contraction can cause the tendon to rupture. So full passive elbow extension is allowed postoperatively, but you're going to limit elbow flexion to 90 degrees for six weeks. And then you have a gradual progression back to full elbow flexion from 6 to 12 weeks uh, as to not to overstretch. So active range of motion at 6 weeks, light isotonics at 10, strength program at 12, but you're going to be non-weight bearing for 8 weeks with this. And so there's a Waterman study. I'll let you read the outcomes and potential complications uh, box here for this surgery. This is kind of what it looks like. You have the triceps tendon tear, of course, here. And they usually look more ra uh, rugged and jagged than this. But this is how it's repaired. They uh, create these cross uh, stitchings through the tendon and then pull it through and tack it down onto the ulna. You can watch this video for this surgery here. All right, and next let's talk about total elbow arthroplasty. So um, 
I'm not going to read through all this. The big things you need to know, <clears throat> the outcomes are usually pretty good, but not as good as other joints. Uh, good for what the purpose is, someone who's not of joint pain. However, this is a big surgery. It's a full reconstruction uh, of the joint, and um, it's not... It's not fun. I've only seen one of these my whole career, and uh, the person did generally well, but uh, one thing I want to make aware to you is that when your elbow is replaced, this is kind of a salvage procedure, okay? Meaning, uh, the goal is to decrease pain and thus improve function. However, it's probably not full function. You're not going to get all your range of motion back. And we know this through outcome studies. So at about six years, approximately 60% of the patients were pain-free. Flexion angle was 130. Extension lag was 30, meaning they had a 30 to 130 range of motion. Supination was 66. We usually like 90. Pronation was 71. Again, 90, so a little stiff there. <clears throat> Complication rate was almost 25%. So uh, that's not good. And overall outcomes, survival rates, uh, you can see the numbers here. As the years go up, the survival rates decrease, but um, good for what the purpose of the uh, surgery is. You can have uh, joint infection, aseptic loosening of the hardware, periprosthetic fractures, tricep insufficiency, bushing wear from the hardware, and then ulnar nerve symptoms some of the complications. This is a big open procedure. You can see that through the picture on the left. This is kind of what the hardware looks like and then what it looks like in the x-ray of an individual who receives this and then here's kind of a artist's rendition of what it looks like as well. And so I encourage you uh, to watch this video. That's going to be it for the surgery uh, lectures, but one thing we will start class with on uh, Thursday is elbow differential diagnosis. And we'll try to answer any questions you have. But this next slide is gonna be a good one for your exam to study. And so this is how I think about the elbow and how the location of symptoms can really help you start to bucket or bracket off certain differential diagnoses. And so I'd have you pause it here and uh, look through each of these uh, boxes. And if you have questions, you can answer them in class come Thursday. Again, you can email me if you have any questions. I appreciate you very much. Thanks for tuning in.